Welcome to this video on diffusion processes and cascades on networks. We start by delving into some theories from sociology about the spread of innovation in social systems. Then we introduce the linear threshold model to describe the process of innovation on social networks. And finally, we offer a simple network characterization that determines whether the innovation will spread to the entire network under the linear threshold model. Let's start by defining what we mean by innovation. An innovation is a change in the way things are done. This innovation can take many forms. It can be a new idea, or a new way of doing things, or a new product. We will focus on innovations in social networks, so our vertices will be people. Examples of innovations include behaviors, opinions, accepted social norms, and the technology that people use. And let's first clarify the distinction between invention and innovation. Invention is the creation of a new thing. And innovation is the dynamic process of how the adoption of that new thing spreads across a network. In order to model that process, we need to identify the factors that facilitate or impede the adoption of innovations. Once again, we turn to the expertise of sociologists to understand human behavior. The theory of diffusion of innovations was popularized by Everett Rogers in his influential book. This diffusion process occurs within a social system and individuals make a personal choice about whether to adopt a new practice based upon its perceived value. They also must weigh the risks and negative effects when making this change. And here are five traits of an innovation. These characteristics factor into a person's decision to switch to something new. The first is relative advantage. How much better is the new way versus the old way? The second is observability. How visible are the benefits of the current adopters? Number three is compatibility. Is the new way radically different from the status quo? Will it disconnect you from the non-adopters? Number four is trial ability. Can you make the change gradually to ease the transition? And finally, number five, complexity. Is making the change difficult because of the inherent complexity of the new way? Individuals also have traits that influence how they weigh the pluses and minuses of adopting an innovation. Ultimately, a person must be motivated to make this change, but the factors behind this motivation are quite varied and complex, and there are differences between technological innovation and social innovation. For now, let's just say that adoption could be about personal benefit or communicating a message to others. Now, a successful innovation process moves through a social system over time, and we can track the distribution of adopters during this process and split people into five categories. The innovators are the people who take the risk of being the first to make the change. They are often relatively close to the invention itself and in close contact with other innovators. The early adopters are opinion leaders with relatively high social status. Perhaps they would be called influencers in our modern lingo. Part of their motivation may be the social capital that comes from being ahead of the curve. They are comfortable with taking some risk and they are swayed by the potential of the innovation. Next comes the early majority. These are people who are swayed by the early adopters. They are activated by evidence that the innovation really works. And this is where the innovation really takes off and gains momentum in the general population. The late majority gets swept along by the momentum created by the early majority. The new innovation transitions to becoming the new normal. The late majority is swayed because it actually becomes more of a negative not to innovate than to adopt the innovation. And finally, we have the laggards. They stubbornly refuse to change, even though adopting would actually be beneficial. We will focus on innovations that directly impact how you interact with your social system. For example, buying the latest cell phone has an effect on how you communicate with others. And remember, this innovation could be the adoption of a new technology, or a new behavior, or a new opinion. All three of these can impact your social engagement. Adopting an innovation has a direct effect. It increases your connection to other adopters, and it decreases your connection to the non-adopters. As a result, there is a network effect to the benefit of adoption. If more of your neighbors have adopted this behavior, then you become even more motivated to also make the change. At a certain point, self-interest will become your primary motivation for switching to the new behavior. So let's turn this theory into a network process we are going to describe the linear threshold model for innovation on a network. The basic idea is that we start with a seed set of early adopters. The innovation then spreads to the vertices with enough early adopters among their neighbors. 
we then repeat this process until it completes. In the example on this slide, the threshold for adoption is that at least half of the neighbors must be adopters. This particular process stops after six vertices have become adopters. The last three vertices will never adopt the new behavior. We will go into more depth on the evolution of this cascade of adoption in a later slide. But let's take a step back and build the linear threshold model from the ground up. We borrow some language from economics and review the adoption of innovation as a coordination game between vertices. Each vertex chooses between behavior A and behavior B. When neighbors V and W coordinate, meaning that they choose the same behavior, they get a payoff. The value of this payoff depends upon the behavior. In other words, the payoff for behavior A could be bigger than the payoff for behavior B. Now when V and W do not coordinate, meaning that they choose different behaviors, their payoff is zero. This slide shows an example of this coordination game. Here vertex 1 has a payoff of 3 times A because 3 of its neighbors have adopted behavior A. Meanwhile, vertices 4 and 5 each get a payoff of B because these neighboring vertices are the only two vertices with behavior B. So we're going to view adoption as a process. And here is a vertex V that is trying to decide whether to adopt behavior A or behavior B. All of its neighbors have already chosen. P times D have chosen A, and 1 minus P D have chosen B. So what behavior should V adopt? Behavior A or behavior B? Pause the video and figure out which choice leads to a bigger payoff. So which behavior is better for vertex V? Behavior A or behavior B? If V adopts behavior A, then its payoff is B times D times A. And if V adopts behavior B, then its payoff is 1 minus P times D times B. Now Vertex is motivated to pick the behavior that gives the highest payoff. In other words, V should adopt behavior A if and only if P times D times A is bigger than 1 minus P times D times B. And a little algebra gives an equation for P in terms of A and B. We find that Vertex V should choose behavior A only when P is greater than or equal to B divided by A plus B. It is worth noting that V is being selfish and following a greedy strategy. V's only concern is to maximize its own payoff. So now we have an adoption threshold Q equal to B over A plus B for each vertex. This is the linear threshold of the linear threshold model. So when V tries to decide what behavior to adopt, it calculates P, the fraction of neighbors that have adopted A. And if P is greater than or equal to Q, V will adopt behavior A, and otherwise V will adopt behavior B. And we can use this same comparison in successive rounds. As different vertices adopt A over B, we may find that V is now ready to switch over to A as well. So in each of these rounds, V looks at its neighbors and then updates its behavior accordingly. And we cycle this update process over all vertices until the adoption process stabilizes. So let's return to the cascading process that we saw a few slides ago. Each vertex is trying to maximize its payoff. In a round, the vertex has a chance to update its behavior. It will change from white to green when at least half of its neighbors are already green. So in step one, vertex five switches because it has two green neighbors and two white neighbors. In step three, both seven and one change to green. This is because seven has two green neighbors and one white neighbor, namely the vertex one. After that, one now has three green neighbors and two white neighbors. Now we could have updated one before seven and we would have ended up in the same place. It turns out that the update order doesn't really matter, though it might affect the total number of rounds. So let's watch another example of the update process. We will start with the entire network using behavior B. Then we will have two innovator vertices, 1 and V, and we will follow a linear threshold model using a threshold value of 1 half. So which vertices change because of 1 and V? It turns out that three vertices change right away, U, 2, and 8. And then, as a consequence, three changes to red, and then four changes. And at this point, the chain reaction halts. No other vertices will adopt the new behavior. We call this total chain reaction a cascade. Okay, so let's look at another example. I've made one change to the network. I've added an edge between vertex U and vertex W. So let's look at what happens on this slightly altered network when we use the same seed set and the same threshold of one half. 
the first round looks the same as before. U, 2, and 8 switch to red. In the second round, we convert 3, and we also convert W. Now 4 changes to red, as does vertex X. Vertices 5 and 7 now make the change, followed by 6. So in this case, the entire network adopts the new behavior, and this is called a complete cascade. So our new question becomes, what allowed us to get a complete cascade this time? Or equivalently, what prevented a complete cascade in the graph missing the UV edge? The answer lies in something called cohesive sets. A cohesive set is a subnetwork that is too insular for the innovation process to penetrate. Before we can define a cohesive set, we must talk about the density of a subset of vertices. So given a subset S, we look at each vertex in S and count the fraction of its neighbors that are in the set. In other words, we want to know the fraction of inward facing edges. The density of S is the smallest fraction that we calculate among all the vertices in S. For example, in this network, the set S1 has density 1 quarter. This is because vertex 1 has density a third while vertex 2 has density 1 quarter, and the density of S1 is the smaller of these two numbers. Using a similar calculation, we find that the density of S2 is a half. We can now define a cohesive set. A set of vertices S is cohesive for threshold value Q when the density of S is greater than 1 minus Q. We will see that when we have a set S that is cohesive for Q, Innovation cannot spread into S unless one or more vertices in S have already adopted the innovation. For example, let's suppose that we set the innovation threshold for this network to be two-thirds. In this case, the set S1 is not cohesive. This is because one-fourth is less than one minus two-thirds, which is one-third. On the other hand, the set S2 is cohesive because one-half is strictly bigger than one-third. In other words, an innovation that starts outside of S2 cannot possibly spread into S2. This brings us to our main theorem about complete cascades. Cohesive sets are the bottlenecks to our cascade process. If we have a cohesive set that is outside of our seed set, then the process cannot spread to the whole network. And the reverse holds as well. If our cascade process halts before spreading to the entire network, then there must be a cohesive set that is outside our initial seed set. So let's return to the example that did not have a complete cascade. We can now see that the five blue vertices that never turn red form a cohesive set. Four of the vertices in S have density two-thirds, and the last one has density one. So the density of this set is two-thirds, which is greater than one minus a half, which is a half. And so the adoption cannot spread into S when it starts outside of that set. In today's activity, you will prove this cascade and cohesive set theorem. I look forward to seeing you in class.